Let me introduce to you Marshall Masters. Well, hello. Thanks hello. for having me on. Thanks for being with us again. It's been a while. Yeah, it is. Yes. Good. Remember all the shows we did together? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, now I must say, you must by now have enough survival beans to last you for decades. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my strategy really on survival right now because I work real heavily with folks that are in awareness. Right. Uh, a lot of people who come to this topic uh, have actually been in awareness since they were children. And a lot of folks don't realize that. And so for them, the real complaint that they have is they go, here I am, I'm in awareness, I understand everything that's coming, I cannot afford beans, bullets, and bunkers, so what's the point of my awareness? And, you know, it, they're, they're taking a material view of it. And what I have really come to understand is that the people who are in awareness about what is coming have a very special role, that being teachers, mentors, and comforters. And so the strategy has been more about helping people to understand you need to be worth your weight in beans. That is how you're going to best ensure your own survival, but also to do so in a meaningful way in service to others. All right. Well, we've gotten a long ways from uh, the simplicity of my grandparents and their lifestyle. Uh, for as many people nowadays, life is just a constant struggle to keep up with their many obligations. Yeah. How much time do you have to devote to worrying about a catastrophe in the future? Well, it's what I do 24-7. <laughs> so that's my life. Uh, well, that's why we have you, Marshall. You, can, you worry for us all. You're like our Thanks. Jewish grandmother. <laughs> 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 okay. You're you're a Jewish grandmother. You worry for us all, so we don't have to. And then we just <laughs> we just check in every once in a while. You give us the latest on uh, you know how much Kleenex we need to and toilet paper we need to stock up. That's where my biggest worry is. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. Well, I mean, forget about the gold. Just stock up a a garage full of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> you know that really is no joking aside. That is a really Critical survival issue. You know, it's amazing how many people they've been. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm buying this, and I'm doing this other thing. And I just simply say, Have you thought about how you're going to wipe your tukas for ten years? Exactly. Now, toilet paper is going to be a hot commodity, and you'll probably be able to get a few beans and whatever else you need for it. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't rot very fast either, you know. Yeah, I'll trade you uh, th three cigarettes for a <laughs> toilet roll. <laughs> Well, here, in, yeah. Well, here in the United States, you know, now we have these marijuana dispensaries. I think those will probably be the first things looted. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that, it kind of be a shame because marijuana will, it will be a very useful thing. You know, absolutely. Circulation. We're going to modern medicine as we know it has a three day lifespan, three to five days, because. After three to five days, all of the diesel fuel in the emergency bunkers at the hospital is gone. And once the hospitals go dark, modern medicine, as we know it, is over. And from there, it's catch as catch can. And so people you would want to have in your community is, to be blunt, you'd want to have a good chemist who knows how to make things like ether, okay? Uh, someone who understands how to take opium poppy seeds and turn them into, you know, something that can be used as pain sedative. Mm -hmm. In some respects, you know, we're going to go back to what medicine was around, you know, the 1900s. Well, I mean, that's if something dastardly should occur. Yeah, well, that's what we're saying. I mean, I mean, I know you've got your money on that horse, but I've got my money on another horse that it's not going to happen. But I'm always interested. I mean, seriously, back in the, what was that, 1800s when the lights went out? The Carrington event? Yeah. yeah. Let's talk a little bit for our listeners who might not be familiar with that event. Well, the Carrington event is very appropriate to our times. I mean, you've heard uh, Obama talking about EMP threat. That's a real problem. Uh, the Carrington event was a solar storm. And at the time it hit, electricity was in its infancy, 
and uh, the telegraph systems were about five years old at that point, both in the United States and Europe. And the Carrington event hit, and particularly in the long lines, that's where you, your biggest vulnerability is. Uh, this caused arcing, sparks, and that set off a whole raft of fires. Also, all right. Now, t- uh, what caused the Carrington know, event again? Uh, that was a, a solar storm, coronal just, mass ejection. Just a coronal mass injection. Right. I've heard about them a lot, but have we seen anything since that time on any high level? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, a few years ago, the the solar storm index always went up to uh, X. That was the highest. But there was one a few years ago that was so large it went off the scale and they had to create a new category Y. The thing that you have to keep in mind is with solar storms, it's the three rules of premium real estate. Location, location, location. In other (laughs) words, I asked the first directive, are we in the crosshairs? When that thing pops up, does it pop off in our direction coming straight at us? If it does, it can be pretty brutal. And if we were to get hit with a solar storm um, that was Earth-directed and something that would be an X or Y class, that would be enough to really take us down. And there's a concern here because in Canada uh, a few decades ago, there was a solar storm that took thousands of homes off of the grid. It caused a lot of problems. And that was uh, one of the reasons why the uh, SOHO satellite was first put up as a solar observatory in space. And now, what I mean, year was that in Canada, do you recall? I, I would have to look that up. Was it yeah. like in the 80s or 70s? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that, was, uh, that was a storm that really woke up everybody. It was March 1989. Okay. Geomagnetic storm. Now, as a result of that, um, you know, then there was – a big effort to start observing the sun more carefully. For many years, there was just one uh, solar observatory satellite out there doing the job. Now there's a whole constellation. I mean, uh, back a few years ago, the major space agencies all across the world launched several different uh, satellite solar observatories up there. So right now they're in a position to see the sniffle before the sneeze, so to speak. Really? Yeah. Now, when you say several, what do you mean by several? How many? Last count, I think there's about six or seven, and those are the ones that are being reported, including JAXA, ESA, Russia, the United States. So uh, there's a, you know, several, several, several that are up there. They must be yeah. seeing a lot of extraterrestrial craft with those things. Boy, you know, we see a lot of reports coming in all the time of UFOs being sighted, uh, you know, from the International Space Station, from SOHO, mm-hmm. from anything else. But on the other hand, you got to remember a lot of these feeds that you get these live feeds coming off, they're pretty well filtered and screened before they go public. That's what I was thinking. And very little gets through that they don't want to get through. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we were talking about that before you came on today, about this Orwellian surveillance system that's set up right now. That's, I mean, I just got two little tiny tickets, okay, one for going seven miles over and one for, uh, they say, entering the intersection a little too late. But there was probably nobody there anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got a red light ticket and a little seven mile over one. I want you to know that was $600. And very severe penalties and points. We have points here in Arizona, a point system that's insane. I want to know, what do you think of that? What do you think of the surveillance system that's enforced nowadays that's just encouraging upon us all? You ain't seen nothing yet. (laughs) I'm serious. You haven't. You know, the next big thing that's going to happen, and this is not far off, is that you're going to see like AT&T and uh, Comcast and these other major service providers, Internet service providers. And now you get a, in your home, you get a modem. The modem connects to a router, and the router handles all your devices in the home. 
Right. Well, to the company that's providing the service, all they see is just your modem, that IP address. Uh, what the next step is going to be is that they're going to take over the role of the router in the house so that they're going to actually see everything going on inside your home network because they will be your home network. So, in other words, they'll know what temperature your refrigerator is? Anything that's web-enabled, so Energy Star appliances, absolutely. Right. Uh, you start taking and combining this information with what they're getting off of the e-meter on the side of your house. Um, you know, I'll tell you, the only thing I haven't seen them planning to do is install toilet seat webcams so that they can tell America, oh, we have enough fiber in our diet. <laughs> <laughs> That's next. <laughs> They're going to be That's at Home right. Depot next week. <laughs> That's right. You know, I mean, it's, Come you out know, camps. Just, there you go. There you go. And it's like, you know, all of a sudden you're going to get a letter in the mail. <laughs> Please install this or we'll come over and do it for you. That's right. And by the way, here's a citation with a whopping fine. You because know. your pol- your your pollution level is too high. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. So well, anything could happen at any time. I mean, I got the point, Care, from what you're telling us. There could be some kind of mishap of some kind that upsets this planet to the point where we can't rely upon our services. Right. Now, and what would all of you out there who are listening do if that were to happen? What would you guys do? Would you just like go, oh, I know what I would do. I'd be like, hmm, uh, how long is this going to be out? How much do I have to ration? Uh, I wouldn't be the kind who would even leave my home because I would figure, figure there's no place that's going to be more comfortable. And, uh, you know, what about that? You know, my biggest, I'll tell you, my biggest fear is nuclear explosion from a nuclear power plant, a nuclear power plant explosion. And we have a huge one here that I protested being built before it was built, and uh, that was a fiasco. All the police were there stun-gunning all these people who were not even doing anything. They were just standing there. They were stun-gunning them. Unbelievable. Uh, I never saw such a for- show of force before by police officers. And, of course, if we go into a survival mode, that show of force by police officers is going to increase dramatically. I was there during the Detroit riots when they started burning down Detroit. And I'll tell you, the first thing that came out was the National Guard with their machine guns. And they started riding up and down the streets in full regalia with their machine guns pointed right at your head. And like that. You know, see if you like that. Yep. yep. That'll get your attention. Oh, baby. It gets your attention big time. And, uh, you know, I was on my way. I had a store in Detroit when it happened. A mm-hmm. liquor store that had only been open six days. It was fully stocked with all brand new merchandise. It wasn't my yeah. idea to get this liquor store. It was my boyfriend's, okay, uh. who I wound up marrying. And anyway, he, so he he bought it. You know, he he didn't even have a chance to draw a check, so he couldn't even get business interruption because he was only open six days. So uh. what happened was uh, he closed up the store, and we waited at a restaurant in the Burbs listening to the news and watching the news trying to figure out what was going on, talking to all the police officers in the suburbs and everything. And they were telling us Detroit was on fire. That was just because some people were upset. Can you imagine if they didn't get any food, what that would look like? My goodness. Well, there's going to be what, what I call the rage that's going to come. People are going to realize they're going to be standing up out in the street, they're going to be pointing up the sky and looking at the Planet X system coming in, and they're going to be saying, hey, hey, have you ever seen anything like that? No, have you ever had? Uh, so you think yeah. we're going to actually see this Planet X system coming in soon? Yeah. Well, we're already, I'm posting images of it, and so, but it's also like ufology. You can have mountains and mountains of evidence, and people are still going to go, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> so that's just the way it is. You, what are, What are the pictures yeah, showing you? Pardon? What are the pictures that you're talking about showing a, a showing to you? What are well, they telling you? On our on our well, what it's telling me is the Planet X system is coming closer. 
if you on our website, yowza.com, or you can also go to marshallmasters.com, uh, we have pictures I just put up that were taken from Germany to altitude. Uh, we call it Planet X Double Trouble. We saw two of the objects and verified it. Uh, you know, they're natural objects, and there's nothing in the field of view that was cataloged. This system is on the opposite side of the sun. Mm -hmm. But also, um, we just published an article called Planet X Science Update Number 5. We do these on a routine basis. Um, this, this article is, it was really depressing for us. Uh, Jennifer Burns put it up, and uh, it took her a solid week. And All right, so tell us about it. Well, what we're seeing just all over the place. Uh, what do you mean by all over the place? All over the world. This is global. Increase in volcanoes, uh, particularly along the rim of fire, disruptions of air travel and air cargo. Um, there's just in on the uh, one that has uh, really caught our attention was Mount Sakajima, and that popped on the fifth. Um, you know we have uh, Momotomo volcano, Colma. Uh, the Shevaluch in Siberia, Cinnabung, uh, Charp let's see, Charpateris Teak, and Mount Ergon. These are currently erupting. I mean, this information is just since the beginning of the year. Earthquakes have picked up tremendously. Uh, one of the things that we find is that the earthquakes are always being downgraded. Yes, and, uh, and yet, did you know about that when they changed the Richter scale? Well, they the changed the Richter scale in the '80s, in the early right. '80s, say, downgrading it a whole point. Right, and but now what they've done is not only downgraded it, but the other thing that they've done is they say, well, you know, we went in and found all kinds of reasons to downgrade these reports that are coming in from other parts of the world, other countries. They're not being downgrading this information. We're the ones that's doing it. But there's a very specific reason for it, and here's how the disinformation flies out. Okay. Is that uh, what they'll say is there's been a decrease in major earthquake events, and they say from Cat 5, you know, from, from uh, 5.0 and above, all right, on the Richter scale. Well, if you look and see how they downgrade these events, they'll take a 5, a 5, 1, a 5, 2, and downgrade it to a 4, 8, or a 4, 9. This is what they do continually. They push them out of the 5s down into the 4s. So if that way, when I've seen them publish articles and they go, uh, seismicity is decreasing, they say order of magnet, you know, the, uh, the Richter scale, 5.0 and above. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've been modifying the data with downgrades and playing around it, and keep in mind, our government does not report all of the earthquakes in the world that other governments are reporting. All really? Right. So, yes. There Why, uh, an agenda, you think, to keep that uh, uh, information away from the American public? Uh, did you get that? If you were going to give it out again, get out your pen and paper. Go ahead and give it again. Y-O-W-U-S-A.com. Or just my name, MarshallMasters.com, and that's with two L's. Very good. All right. So, uh, Bill, you had a question for Marshall here. Are you something uh, you want yes, to talk about? Mm -hmm. Yes, Marshall, you sent me some links. I checked out the links. And um, there are mainly some videos and um, some uh, articles uh, you posted on your website. Um, now, one of the videos talked about, um, you know, the September 2015 it was like a non-event event, and I was wondering what the significance of that, you know, was all about. Well, that went back to the blood moon tetrad theory. Right. And that was something that came out of nowhere and really swept through the, the Christian community particularly, mm -hmm. and it brought a whole new audience to the topic of Planet X because it was all focused on blood moon tetrad theory. Mm -hmm. and, I, I'm not catching yeah. the word you're saying. Blood moon tetrad theory. Blood moon tetrad? Tetrad theory. What's a tetrad? Well, this is red moons. Oh. Right? And that are timed with Jewish holidays, high holidays. 
So it was something where there was the position that was put out that when these events happened, when we'd see a blood moon that uh, coinciding with some sort of Jewish holiday, there would be uh, a catastrophic event or the beginning of a catastrophic event. And when that first came out, I mean, our position on it was it was coincidental. We didn't see the direct relationship. Um, what I was talking about in the video was that in September there was the blood moon tetrad theory. There was also the Pope's visit, and CERN was being fired up again. And so one of the things that we see with disinformation management is that this informationalist will look for public concerns, and then what they do is echo them, turn up the volume on them, uh, volume, so that it draws a lot of people in into essentially what's going to be a non-event. So then you have the non-event, and people go, "Oh boy, I got suckered in on that one." Right. And what are they going to do? Throw and you don't know what you're here. talking about. That's right. You know, and you've already, you know, humiliated yourself with family and friends, and they've been telling you it's all nonsense, don't mm -hmm. want to hear about it, nothing's going to happen. And so what happens is they become right, you become wrong. That right. doesn't mean your concern's not justified. Right. All right. And a blood moon tetrad theory is something that really is an early harbinger that would relate to something much further downstream. With CERN, I think that's definitely a concern when the, one of the men who did the theoretical basis, the underpinning of CERN, said they don't know what the F blink that they're doing. And, and they are really, you, you know, they're wielding some immense power there. Uh, then there was the Pope's visit, and that was, you know, the only result of the Pope's visit was, you know, maybe out of some, someone should suggest to the Pope to get a new speechwriter. And, other than that, that month was just, you know, we watched a whole lot of interest, a lot of people getting stampeded, all right, and that's what we call them, stampedes. And they get stampeded down these pointless rabbit holes, and then they feel humiliated, and they walk away, and they stop looking. They stop thinking. They stop questioning. And that's what's really important. Awareness is something that cannot be prevented. People become aware on an individual basis because they're looking at something and they're asking that one fateful question. What exactly am I seeing here? All right. And that's the first step to awareness. So the elites who control the media do a superb job of ignoring what they can't stop, which is awareness. They focus on consensus. That's what they don't want. You have enough people come into consensus. Now you have something, a movement. You have to deal with it. All right. So if they can conquer and divide, create dissension, humiliation, fracture the conversations, prevent consensus, it's, you know, it, it all goes nowhere. Now, Marshall. And that's what yeah. they do. They do, yeah, it, if they I do can, it very, very excellently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can step in here. The devil is due. Now, you know, this date. September 2015. I remember talking about that years ago. There's uh, a number of uh, news articles that uh, one here, end of the world postponed. Um, Mayan scholars have updated their doomsday prophecy. Now, this, this report here was posted back in October 20th, 2010, that they made an error with the, uh, the Mayan calendar, uh, did not end in December of 2012, uh, they redid the math on that at the Scripps Institute, and they found out that the end date was actually September 3rd, 2015. And then there's this other report here about a Hebrew calendar. Uh, this John, Jonathan Kahn uh, is his name, and he wrote a book mm -hmm. called, called The Harbinger, and he put a date. This was back in 2012, and I remember talking about this on the air. Uh, he wrote this book called The Harbinger, Talking, uh, predicting financial calamity in September of 2015. So this data, September 2015, has been rolled around for a number of years here. It has been. You know, but I will tell you, the first rule of prophecy mm -hmm. and predictions is to be aware of it, but do not live in expectation of it. Right. 
You know, like Yoda said, <laughs> the future is uncertain. Always in motion is the future. And timelines shift, things will change. So it's literally about being aware. You know, frankly, in what I do and on my research effort, uh, people always say, date, date, date. When, what's the date? What's the date? What's the date? What's the date? And what I have learned is the fastest way to make people go back into their shell, stop thinking, stop preparing, stop planning, give them a date that they can put on the calendar. And then what they do is they look at the billing cycles on their credit cards, figure out an optimal time to go to Costco and clear out the card, clear out the shelves, and then they feel like, okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. I've got it solved, and they stop doing what they need to be doing and looking and listening. Uh -huh. um, likewise, when I, another question I get from people all the time is, when am I going to see Planet X with my own two eyes? Now, I, what I tell them is that question is as dumb as a sack of hammers. Because the right question is, when will I believe that what I am seeing with my own two eyes is a clear and present danger? You see, even when the Planet X system becomes visible, what people are going to hear from the government is it's just an interesting light show, don't worry about it. Might be a few little trifles, but don't worry about it. Right. And people are going to buy it. Because people cling to the bliss of ignorance like jealous lovers. Not now, what, what, when do you think that visibility is going to be more than it is today? Yes. I mean, the, the trends are, I mean, we are getting more observation reports from people at this time than ever before. That this, uh, that this is a huge planet before. coming in, is that what you're saying? Right, that's right. And now Actually, doesn't it have it? It's a mini constellation. It's a brown dwarf with planets and moons. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Marshall. We're talking yeah, about me, the brown dwarf, right? Planet X. Yeah. Okay, now planet there's X. there's a couple of news articles that I have here. And um, they were posted just a few months ago, right around November, December time frame. And it says here that the Pope says this may be our last Christmas. The Queen... Yep. The Queen's Christmas message, enjoy your final Christmas. What is going on here? What do they know that we don't? Well, you know, we saw those come out. What was interesting to me was I tra both of those traced back. It was single source articles coming out of the same tabloid in England. Mm. And so my first impression was I would have wanted to see uh, multiple sources reporting on this. Yes. All right. So we're talking about yeah. a black op little scare tactic. Could be. A, it could be the real McCoy. It could be a black op. It could be uh, any number of things. Remember, the elites do, they have an obligation to share knowledge. It could be a structured leak. Right. right? And the thing here is what we're seeing on the big scale, is we see a wide range of things happening around the world that are very disturbing. I mean, if you read this article, and it's a long article, it's like 14 pages, Planet X sign, update number five, it's on our site right now. It's encyclopedic. It really takes you from alpha to omega, you know, trip around the world of all of the weird things that are happening. And there are, when you look at it in totality, it is stunning. And what you realize it's now, where did you say to go to hear see this? This is uh, my site, YOWUSA.com, okay. MarshallMasters.com. This is the first article up there. It's Planet X Signs, update number five. We just posted that on the 6th. Mm -hmm. and if you go and you, you read that article, what you're going to realize is that there's a lot of very unsettling things happening around the world, very abnormal things. Mm -hmm. um, what do you attribute all that to? Well, we're attributing this to the approach of this Planet X system uh, that is interacting with our sun, but we're also passing through a region of the solar system where we're also getting hammered with the galactic superwave coming from the center of our galaxy. Now, oh, let's that's, talk uh, about that's, the galactic superwave. That's Paul LaViolette talks about that's that quite Paul a bit. Paul LaViolette, yes. And, uh, Paul, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to interview Paul years ago. He doesn't want to give interviews now. Yes, yes, I but, noticed that. <laughs> you 
you know, he's, uh, there's a lot of, people really don't understand how much suppression and manipulation in this there is. Okay. All right, let's talk about uh, this galactic super wave. Okay. Uh, what the galactic super wave is, what Paul the Violet is talking about, is that uh, when we pass through, what, what the Mayans were looking to see is if we were going to pass through the uh, horizon, if you will, uh, the center of the galaxy, all right? And when you pass through that, there's energy waves that are emanating from the center of the galaxy. And we're flying through that, and that's causing a lot of problems. And what Paul LaViolette noticed was that young suns that are large, bright young suns that are highly unstable, they tend to supernova more often during this, in this region of space than not. And so we are passing through this region of space. Now, the, the thing that uh, with the Mayan calendar, and you brought that up earlier, and uh, I remember year, back in 2012, it was August of 2012, I was interviewed by National Geographic, and the producer asked me, he said, do you see a direct correlation between the Mayan calendar and Planet X? Well, at the time I said, no, I don't see anything. It's coincidental. We don't, because I just go off the empirical data. I'm looking for evidence. All right, um, you know, we're, you see in our articles, we are tracking good local news sites um, with the stories that you're finding that are reported on local level. Uh, excellent journalism. Excellent journalism. When it goes up in the mainstream, it gets into the field of dismissive propaganda and manipulation of the stories. But once, if you go back to the original local reporting phenomenal and so we're seeing these patterns all of this cover-up and the thing about planet x and 2012 2012 was a date that it was a date driven event that was a massive expectation stampede and we were looking for empirical data and the only numbers you could find were in the arbitron rankings for the cable networks that they were making a fortune all right, but we couldn't find anything else. Now, what we did do was we started reporting. Well, we reported in an article on this, and actually, uh, we do have an uh, article about the Mayans. And what we found was that the Mayans weren't looking for something in the sky to tell them that they were already in a catastrophe. What's the point? You're looking for a harbinger sign, something that's going to give you enough time to. You know, take a seven lean cows, seven fat cows kind of approach to stockpiling and preparing for a difficult time. Uh, that's what they were looking for. And when we started looking at the post-December 21, 2012, empirical data for meteors and for earthquakes, we were stunned. Because right after December 21, 2012, you had this, you know, gradually rising trend that just took off and it kind of reminds you of, you know, Roadrunner and Coyote, the Acme Rockets, boom, straight up. And it just took off like Acme Rockets. And since December 21, 2012, we have seen it's just mind-boggling what's happening and all of the things that we're seeing. And it's, you know, like I said, if your listeners read this article, they're going to see that. And what you're going to see is that evidence of how this knowledge is being withheld from people. So the real question, folks, is why all of the propaganda, why all the disinformation, why all the suppression? Now, in Russia, didn't they build underground uh, uh, facilities for their populace? Oh, yeah. I mean, Russians are building underground shelters like crazy. Um, other countries are even far ahead of them. Sweden has enough underground capacity for all of its citizens. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And the United Nations paid for a lot of that, by the way. Unbelievable. Uh, so now, what so we're paying for, for it, you mean? <laughs> yeah, we're paying for it. So what's happening here in the United States? Well, they did, they're not building bunkers for us. What they're doing is they bought 1.8 billion rounds of small arms hollow point ammunition. To blow our That's brains not- out. Absolutely. And so when the time comes for what I call the rage, people are going to realize they've been had, and it's too late. And 
you know, then they're going to make up all kinds of signs and placards and match, march down to the federal buildings and start, you know, we're citizens and all this righteous indignation. And the police are going to come out in their MRAPs and with their machine guns and their military outfits. And you see, the thing of it is the soldiers cannot carry hollow point ammunition, but peace officers can. And so they're just going to say, all right, dismiss, and then they don't dismiss, and they'll ask them a second time. They don't. The crowd will be, you know, going and jeering all of that, and then they'll just open fire, and there are going to be bodies. What is a hollow point bullet? What what, what is the difference? A hollow point bullet is a dum-dum slug. Uh, That's a term that was used. Uh, Hunters are, if you have a standard military round, it's a full metal jacket. All right, so it's a completely sealed projectile. A hollow point is opened at the front, has a small hole. Well, what is and, the point uh, between the two, the difference? Hollow, when when you get hit with a full metal jacket, it'll just go through you, all right? It's like a little rocket, if you will. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're using um, a dum-dum slug, all right, a hollow point, it hits it expands, it mushrooms out, and it just starts tearing everything apart. Ugh. And so if you get hit with a hollow point, it's going to cause severe, severe damage. Much oh, more damage. my God. And uh, what this will be is like another Kent State. Remember, uh, I'm old enough to remember with Kent State. As a matter of fact, I was in the National Guard. At the well, time. My, my friends were down there, a lot of them. I'm from Detroit. Right. right. Okay. So... You know, what did they do? All of those anti-war riots were really, you know, uh, creating a lot of grief for the government. So they set up a situation. They put National Guardsmen out there who were in no way trained with M14s, 30-odd six rounds, okay? Uh, and this is, you know, this is, a, this is a deer gun, basically a semi-automatic deer rifle. And so... Uh, they, you know, put in some provocateurs, whatever, trigger it. These guys start firing volleys and kids are dying. That's right. And, and everyone went out. home and never came back out again. Exactly. It had exactly. the desired effect. Okay, Marshall, so, I, I yeah. have one, do it again. Huh? Yes, I have one more item here I'd like to uh, talk about uh, before we end the show today. Because we would like to have you back because we do have a lot more to talk about. And sure, this is an incredible subject. Absolutely. Incredible. And it's so fascinating. Okay, now, uh, the one thing that I wanted to cover here before we end the show um, is this Google Earth. Uh, the, well, it's Google Sky. They uncovered an area that they had blacked out. And they gave the coordinates of this star. It looks like a winged star. And it's at coordinates uh, 5 hours, 42 minutes, 21 seconds. 22 degrees, 36 minutes, 44 seconds. That's the coordinates on Google Sky, what looks like a winged star. Right. Do you have any thoughts about this? You know, what, what are we looking at here? Uh, we published an article on that. Uh, that was actually a very, very effective uh, disinformation scam that was run on the public. Uh, we and, and if you go back and you read our article let me get that title for the article for you all right we got uh, one called, minute left here marshall and then we're gonna have to yes, say toodaloo we're out of time. let me introduce to you marshall masters well hello thanks Hel- for having me on thanks for being with us again it's been a while yeah, it is. Yes. Remember all the shows we did together? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Because yeah. Now, now, I must say, you must by now have enough survival beans to last you for decades. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My strategy really on survival right now because I work real heavily with folks that are in awareness. Right. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people who come to this topic uh, have actually been in awareness since they were children. And a lot of folks don't realize that. And so for them, the real complaint that they have is they go, 
here I am, I'm in awareness, I understand everything that's coming. I cannot afford beans, bullets, and bunkers. So what's the point of my awareness? And, you know, it, they're, they're taking a material view of it. And what I have really come to understand is that the people who are in awareness about what is coming have a very special role, that being teachers, mentors, and comforters. And so the strategy has been more about helping people to understand you need to be worth your weight in beans. That is how you're going to best ensure your own survival, but also to do so in a meaningful way in service to others. All right. Well, we've gotten a long way from uh, the simplicity of my grandparents and their lifestyle. Uh, for as many people nowadays, life is just a constant struggle to keep up with their many obligations. Yeah. How much time do you have to devote to worrying about a catastrophe in the future? Well, it's what I do. Twenty-four <laughs> seven. That's my life. Uh, well, that's why we have you, Marshall. You can, you worry for us all. You're like our Jewish you. grandmother. <laughs> okay. You're you're our Jewish grandmother. You worry for us all, so we don't have to. And then we just <laughs> we just check in every once in a while. You give us the latest. Uh, you know how much Kleenex we need to and toilet paper we need to stock up. That's where my biggest worry is. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. Well, I mean, forget know. about the gold. Just stock up a, a garage full of toilet paper. <laughs> you know, that really is, no joking aside, that is a really critical survival issue. You know, it's amazing how many people, they've been saying, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm buying this, and I'm doing this other thing, and I just simply say, have you thought about how you're going to wipe your tuchus for 10 years? Exactly. Now, toilet paper is going to be a hot commodity, and you'll probably be able to get a few beans and whatever else you need for it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't yeah. rot very fast either, you know? Yeah, I'll trade you uh, th three cigarettes for a toilet roll. <laughs> well, here in, yeah, well, here in the United States, you know, now we have these marijuana dispensaries. I think those will probably be the first things looted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it kind of be a shame because marijuana will, it will be a very useful thing. You know, Absolutely. in tribulation, we're going to, modern medicine as we know it has a three-day lifespan, three to five days, because after three to five days, all of the diesel fuel in the emergency bunkers at the hospital is gone. And once the hospitals go dark, modern medicine as we know it is over. And from there, it's catch as catch can. And so people you would want to have in your community is, to be blunt, you'd want to have a good chemist who knows how to make things like ether, okay? Uh, someone who understands how to take opium poppy seeds and turn them into, you know, something that can be used as pain sedative. Mm -hmm. In some respects, you know, we're going to go back to what medicine was around, you know, the 1900s. Well, I mean, that's if something dastardly should occur. Yeah, well, that's what we're saying. I mean, I mean, I know you've got your money on that horse, but I've got my money on another horse that it's not going to happen. But I'm always interested. I mean, seriously, back in the what was that 1800s when the lights went out? The Carrington event. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit for our listeners who might not be familiar with that event. Well, the Carrington event is very appropriate to our times. I mean, you've heard Obama talking about EMP threat. That's a real problem. Uh, the Carrington event was a solar storm. And at the time it hit, electricity was in its infancy, and uh, the telegraph systems were about five years old at that point, both in the United States and Europe. And the Carrington event hit, and particularly in the long lines, that's where you, your biggest vulnerability is. Uh, this caused arcing, sparks, and that set off a whole raft of fires also. All right. Now, uh, was, what caused the know, Carrington event again? Uh, that was a, a solar storm, coronal just, mass ejection. Just a coronal mass injection. Right. I've heard about them a lot, but have we seen anything since that time on any high